supposed to take the makers off the table, but it's oh, all it's too late now. Might as well take. I a did sip. not see that coming. Oh my it's God. the lore. It's the mystique of it all. We're still doing it. We haven't been cut off yet. Oh shit! Good job, buddy. Nice job, Daniel. Good job. Keep that rod bent. Keep that rod bent. I mean, people used to get so scared of them, they had to shoot them. Yeah, that's true. But because you literally can't stop thinking about it, you know, you haven't, you can't scratch the itch enough. All right, and we're back. Another episode of the Spot Burn Podcast. Today we have an awesome one in store. We're excited about this. You got Dan and Josh, and we get to interview someone who, if you've been in the fly fishing world, especially here in the upper Midwest, thinking about muskies, a name you have absolutely run across. He has influenced for sure me and many other people in our generation to to stick with it, to get into it, um, to do things that not everybody else is doing. So we're excited. We got Bill Shear today. Bill, welcome to the Spot Burn Podcast. Thanks, guys. Glad to be here. So I want to jump right in. Um, we're going to cover a lot today, but we like to we like to come out firing a little bit. So I'd love to hear. You know, I, I don't think, especially in this area, there are people that have as decorated and as long and consistent of a career in the industry and in the sport of fly fishing as you do. Um, you know, going back multiple, multiple decades. I'm trying to avoid a number there, Bill. You, you can say the number if you want, but it's, <laughs> it's a long time. How have you kept the passion hot? How, why, do you still love it as much as you did back then? I still do love it. I, actually, I probably love it now more than I did 40 years ago. Uh, uh, and, and I started fly fishing 60 years ago. Um, grew up fly fishing. The, the thing that I love the most is taking somebody else out. It doesn't give me a big thrill to catch another fish. You know, if I'm out fishing with my wife or something and catch a fish, she's like, ooh, ooh, we got to take a picture of that. Like, nobody needs to see me holding up another big slobber of fish. I got a lot of them pictures. <laughs> Don't need that. Uh, but I get, I get more thrill out of watching somebody else get it. They finally get it. They get the hook set. They land the fish. It doesn't matter if that fish is 30 inches or 50 inches. They're still the happiest guy on the planet right there. And that, to me, makes – that's what turns my crank. I, I really, really love that part of it. I really don't ever want to give that up. I, I know that I'm going to have to sooner or later, but uh, it, it, it's something that that I really, really love. I, I – Occasionally, towards the end of the season, I don't mind going out and taking myself fishing, but I, I'd rather go with somebody because I have more fun that way. When did that light bulb moment kind of happen for you? When, like, how how back far back did it the the guiding begin, and where did you like find that love? Oh, I started guiding um, before I was in high school, or I mean, before I was in college when I was still in high school. Uh, I, I was guiding um, back in the day when 25 bucks a day was that 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 was uh, that was your pay with it. Hey. <laughs> wow. wow, that was the going rate back then. That was the rate. 20 bucks plus a five dollar tip. Wow. Did you, if you got if you caught a lot of fish that day, they usually take you out to dinner. OK, <laughs> fancy. <laughs> Did you have to provide lunch back then too? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. But usually the lunches were were there was nobody that was independent. But I, well, let me put it a different way. Everybody was independent, but there was nobody that was uh, doing it on their own. You always did it through a lodge or a resort or something. Uh, Red Crown, for instance, down on Trout Lake would have. Uh, a salesman's meeting and they'd call up the local sports shop and they'd say, Hey, we need 60 guides for the next four days, you know, and they, they would call everybody. And if you were good, you got the call first and you got the better choice of people. So as you got better, you got, you know, the, the higher ups in the food chain, which might give you a $10 tip instead of a $5 tip. Oh yeah. <laughs> wow. That's a pretty young age to get started guiding, Bill. What was it? What was going through your head at that time in your life when when you uh, decided you wanted to get into this? Well, 
I, I've always been in the outdoors in one way or the other. My parents owned a boys and girls summer camp. So we were always connected with outdoor stuff. You know, you always ran into guides. You knew the local guide at the, everybody met at the, either the, the hardware store or the lumber yard, depending on what you wanted to call it in those days. And they all talked about fishing and, and who was the hot guide and who were the, the old masters and things like that. So I always gravitated toward that. My senior year of high school, I only went to high school for about like three and a quarter years. I graduated early, and then I went to work at uh, Alpine Lodge on the West Isle Lake team. So uh, I ran into a lot of the really good old musky guides there. And, who are, and who they are really the names that? Like, like oh, I think oh, I could probably guess, but it'd be way more fun to hear you share. Jules Novak was a big influence on me. He really got me into the guiding more than any of the other old guides did. Uh, of course, Porter was around then. Um, I think, uh, Pop Dean, you know, it just, uh, Eddie Walters, all those guys were, were somewhat of an influence on me, but Jules was probably the biggest influence on me. He's the one who really pushed me into, into taking up guiding. It might sound like a stupid question, but when you started guiding, was it with a fly rod or was this conventional? No, it had to be conventional. I still fly fish, but uh, there weren't that many people um, that that associated this area with fly fishing. And it really it wasn't until the 80s when I started um, with the ICFA program and, and started putting some record fish, warm water fish still in, in the book. Still got a lot of them. <laughs> So yeah, that that's when uh, that that's when things really started to pick up up here for the fly fishing. Yeah, you know, and I, I was I was out of college by then, but it was it was through efforts of people like myself that really um, put warm water fishing on the on the map. There was there was people all around that wanted to stop fish. And there were people that would crappie fish or bluegill fish for a couple of years, a couple of weeks out of the year, uh, that they would fly fish. But they didn't fly fish for, you know, occasionally they'd catch a bass when they were crappie or bluegill fishing. Um, maybe a pike would cut them off. You know, a muskie would eat a bluegill, but, uh, you know, that wasn't something that they were even thinking about. It wasn't on their radar. And what really got me started with muskies was muskies kept eating my bass poppers when I was bass fishing when I was in high school. So that's really what started me on the muskies. People told me I couldn't catch a muskie on a fly rod. I thought I didn't pop them. <laughs> <laughs> they probably still tell you that today, I bet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Well, how big of a rod do you need? You know, how do they how do they eat those little flies? Insects, right? They eat insects, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, you, yeah. You made a you made a comment about kind of like where you were at when you started guiding and looking up to the masters. And I'll, I'll say it: I think you've you know for sure, without a doubt, without any disagreement, become one of those masters. What would you tell yourself sitting where you are now, telling telling the, the spry uh, high school version of Bill starting out at his beginning of his career? What would you What'd you go back and tell them? Oh, geez. Uh, you know, I'd have to go back to, to what my grandpa used to tell me. Listen to nature. Nature will tell you everything you need to know. And when you're on the water, my grandfather was a, a really great fisherman. And uh, when you're on the water, pay attention. You know, uh, Electronics today have ruined it, um, but it, back in the day, you know, you had to learn the water. You couldn't, you couldn't just go out there and sit in a boat and expect fish to show up. You had to figure out where the fish were. You had to figure out what they were eating that day, and you had to figure out what time of the day they were going to feed the most. 
And if you started catching fish, if you kept doing that same thing, you could catch fish anywhere on that body of water, whether it was a lake or a river, during their feeding window using those same techniques. I still do that today. I still do that. When I get on the water, I have some notions of what's going to work and just because of time of the year and experience and so on. Um, and I, I start out doing that. And if I don't get anything within the first half hour, it's like, okay, the fish are doing something different. They're in a different place. They're, they're, they're maybe they're feeding deeper. Maybe they're in real shallow water. Whatever it is that I'm not doing now, I've got to switch and do that. So I'll, I, if i got two guys in the boat, I'll put one of them on a big thinking line and a smaller fly because the, the, the general rule is smaller, deeper, darker. A smaller fly, run it deeper, and it should be a darker color. That, that's the rule. So oh, you do that, and if you start running into fish, okay, boom, both guys get that. And we we keep doing that until we don't find any fish anymore. And it's musky fishing, so there's not going to be a fish on every every bend and every pool and so on that's feeding. That, that's just common. But the majority of the fish that feed are going to feed in that window, whether that's from noon to one or early in the morning or in the evening or whatever it is, uh, those fish in that window are going to be the most active. And you'll run into more fish doing that than you will in changing a fly every 20 minutes and trying something different and trying this and trying that. Um, you know, take your, take your cues from from nature. If that fish came up off the bottom and came straight up at the fly, well, by golly, that's what you ought to be doing. Um, and, and, and if it came up after that seven or eight inch fly instead of that 12 inch fly, well, that tells you something right away. They don't want a T-bone. They want some M&Ms. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Man, that's just, that's such, that's such good advice too, especially, I think you mentioned it, sitting where we sit today in the world of every electronic under the sun and technology and flies and rods and it's, it's still listen to nature. Um, I think, I think we all could hear that message a little bit more in, in lots of different ways. Um, it also is cool to hear you think about it or talk about it because I, I would, you know, not blowing smoke. I'd probably, I don't know that there's anybody who's logged more time alive with a musky rod in there in a musky boat with a fly rod. And I think what we see here at the shop, and you probably see this too, is what people struggle with the most about musky, especially fly fishing, is when it's going well, it's, it's obvious, right? The fish eat the fly. We know where they're at. You feel like you're on top of the world. But it's all the the 90% of the time where they're not giving you any feedback. And you got to have that experience like you're talking about to not just rifle through your fly box and, oh, it's got to be the fly. It's got to be the fly. If I just find the right fly, I might I might... Get one, and it's 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 not that simple. Guys, all the time we're in a boat, we're going down the river. It's a slow day. We've seen maybe one or two fish. Normally, I would see five or six or seven in that same stretch. And the guys are like, "You think we ought to change flies?" I'm like, "Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Because this is what they're going to eat. Mm-hmm. That's what we just." Know? The same fly and hand it to him, maybe with like a different. Here you go. This one's cleaner. Would you like that one? <laughs> yeah. So about about the gear a little bit, and I, I want to I want to come back to that whole, uh, especially hearing you say listen to nature and the onset of technology. But before we do that, back in the day, you were fly fishing for muskies and bass. What were you using? What was the gear like? I mean, and I know we we don't need to go totally down this rabbit hole, but like. You didn't have bite wire, I assume, or what were you know what the rods looked like, what the flies like. Where where was it at then? Well, there were no fly, there were no lines. You know, we you I started with an eight weight glass rod. Yep. Uh, uh, because my bamboos, my old bamboos, those were just trout rods. They weren't heavy enough. Maybe you'd use one for bluegills every once in a while. Um, but the, the eight weight was about the heaviest fleet that you could really get anywhere around here. I, I had St. Croix one year make me a 10 weight 
nine and a half foot. And really all they did was, luckily they added more on the butt instead of added more on the tip. So it was primarily, it was a carpet rod, but it was, and it was a, it was a piece of lumber. I mean, it weighed, you know, 800 pounds. Um, and, you know, you put on the biggest salmon reel that you could find, not knowing anything about the fish to, to speak of. You know, I mean, you had, you had deer guys telling you what to do, but that didn't really compute. Fly lines, you made your own fly line. I would take like, uh, the end of a tarpon line. I, I've got it somewhere and I haven't been able to find it, uh, for many years. I've got a line splicer. And it was kind of like the old uh, tape deck slice, if, if you know what that was like. You know, you, you kind of cut the line at an angle, and you 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 whipped it together, and you you, you glued it with some plyo bond, and you know, you take about three fly lines to try to make a taper that was heavy enough to to be able to throw the fly, but it would still, you know, floating. The lines didn't float all that well, but they didn't sink like an intermediate or even a hover line. So, uh, you know, you would try to, try to put a little bit of lead pour on the end or something like that. They usually only lasted about two or three weeks before they started getting pretty crappy. But, you know, fly lines were also 15 bucks. Right. So, you know, you could, you could buy a couple of fly lines without killing yourself. I think I saw, it's crazy. I think I saw there's a new fly line that came out for tarpon. That's $190, uh, this year. Oh, yeah. But there's, there's yeah. $50 fly line. Yeah. You know. it's crazy. How did, uh, I mean, th- what's so crazy to me about this, um, is not only did you not have the gear, cause I felt like even when we started all fly fishing, you know, early 2000s, that next big resurgence of, kind of the, the warm water game. It still didn't have all the gear, but it wasn't anything like what it was when you started. And we at least had the resources, the YouTubes, the books, how to fly fish for musk. Like it was a thing. It was written down. You had none of that. So like even well, like the of the fly line, where, where, tell me where your thought was at there. How are you, what were you thinking? Well, I mean, there was, there was information available, but you had to, you had to buy a book or you had to talk to somebody you know, I would send a letter. I and mean, that's how, we, when, when we first started with the master's program with fly flies, everybody would tie six flies. And you'd send six flies to one guy. He would take one out of the package and he would send it to another guy. He would send, you know, five flies to another guy. And then he, then that guy would take a, a fly and send four flies. So, so you got your fly to six different guys that were of different Genres. I mean, I would send flies to somebody in Florida so that they could look at the fly, and somebody in Arkansas, and somebody in Texas, you know, and some a striper guy on the East Coast, and the you know, and then a month later you would get back all of the feedback. Try this, try that, and some, and each one of those guys would buy would would tie six flies that they thought would be a, a Maybe not an improvement, but a different technique or something. And those would go all the way back through all the chain and get back to you. You'd have, you'd end up with six flies because you would end up, because you started the chain, you would end up with everybody's idea. But then you could sit there and you could take the flies and you could look at them along and go, oh wow, that's cool. That would work. Where'd you get this? Where'd you get that? Occasionally you would call somebody on the phone, but you know, in the 70s and early 80s, that wasn't a guarantee. Right. Especially from up here. Mm. Crowdsourcing the research and development, though, is kind of cool. That's sweet. What kind so, of... Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Bill. Well, I was just going to say, so the, the leader stuff that we use, I mean, there was nylon-coated wire available, you know, in the 70s. So... uh that's that's what we used, but it was it was clunky, it was big, but of course uh, the fish weren't as well educated, and uh, you know you you face a lot in in the weeds and things like that. That's what uh, drove me to developing the weed card that I used was, uh, you know, you you were fishing in heavy cover, 
You had to have something that that would get through the cover. Muskies are unique. You know, a bass, a pike, a walleye, everything else will take the fly in the middle of the weeds. Muskies won't. Muskies will wait for that fly to get in an opening, and then they'll take it. They don't like to miss. So they want a clear shot at it. They don't want to go plowing through the weeds to get to it. They'll be hiding in the weeds. They'll sneak up through the weeds, but they wait for that fly to get into either a bathtub size or larger opening in the middle of the weeds in the lily pad, or they wait for the fly to break out of the, the weed line. You ever watch a little bluegill come shooting out of the weed line? You know, you got real heavy cabbage weed, and the bluegill comes out into the open, and he stops about two feet out, looks around, and he goes, I made it. And he comes <laughs> around and goes back real quick. <laughs> He's been scarred one too many times. Yeah. Well, he, he watched his, he watched his 720 brothers and sisters. Yeah. Did he? yeah. That's a real finding Nemo moment right there. Yeah. <laughs> Far from home. Bill, your grandfather influenced you heavily when you were a youngster to get into fly fishing. So he did a lot of uh, bass fly fishing. Did he do any musky fly fishing as well? No. No. Uh, he did. He did primarily panfish and and bass okay that, that was and my grandfather you know my dad too my dad was born in the depression so they were kill them and grill them guys mm-hmm. you know uh my my grandfather was bill my dad was bill so i i being the prodigy i got to 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 go with them on fishing trips and as soon as i got good enough to catch my limit all by myself well then I had to bring one of my other younger brothers. <laughs> <laughs> so that, and that was the reason why they took me is because I was a warm body that would stay in the boat that would let them bring more fish home. Right. Oh, right. sure. Right. Yep. yep. More rods in the water, more fish in the bucket. Right. Yeah. And it, uh, there was uh, there was one time I was I was I used to guide in Florida in the winter time. I don't anymore. Uh, but I got a tip from one of my buddies down there. It was a big school of redfish, and all the guys were blowing past them and going, you know, six miles up in, into the Mosquito Lagoon, and the fish were right next door to this fish camp. Nobody knew it. So um, I'm out there one day with one of my younger brothers, and we caught like two dozen red, all sight fishing. And these reds would come up on the flat. They'd cruise through the flat and then go back down off of it. And we were chasing them around on the flat. About, about the third time we're chasing them around, I said to my brother, I said, you know, this is pretty stupid. They're always coming up in the same spot. We're always going down in the same spot. Why don't we just wait for them where they come up? Because it's about 20 minutes between where they come up and where they go back down. So, sure enough, we just sat there. Next pot of fish came up, caught a couple of them, moved the boat 50 yards, waited for them to come off the flat, caught a couple more. Move the boat back over. And so the next day, my dad says, hey, he says, can I go fishing with you guys? <laughs> and we're like, oh, yeah, dad, this would be fun, you know. And and this particular younger brother was just off of a pretty nasty divorce, so he wasn't interested in, in women at all. <laughs> and and uh, we're out there, and I hook up on his face. My brother hooks up on his face. They're both first-sized red. He gets his in first, and let it go. I get mine in. I just about get ready to release it. And Dad's like, what's the matter with you boys? We promised our women some fish. My little brother goes, I didn't promise any women anything. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But, you know, that was just, that was Dad's mindset was that, you know, you went fishing for food. You didn't go fishing for fun. Mm-hmm. And, and, and it, I, I don't think he really ever got over that completely in his life was that you could release the fish and still have a lot of fun with them. Mm-hmm. That's crazy. That's a crazy story. How do you think? How do you think about that today? Do do you do you think there's any room for the fact that we may have overcorrected? You know, from we used to shoot them and eat everything we caught to now, it feels like some people lose sight of the fact that we're playing with our food or what was once our food. Do you, am I am I making that up, or do you see like do you see it as a generally a good thing as to where we got to right now? Well, uh, I think it's a good thing that we got to where we are. Uh, 
and I probably am one of those overboard people, but it's my it's my livelihood. You know, I, I need those fish in the water mm-hmm. so that I can turn more people onto that same fish. You know, I've, I've probably caught in some cases the same musky a half a dozen times. Um, so uh, there's something to the fact that we're we're handling the fish maybe too much or incorrectly, and that that needs to be something that we think about. Um, you know, I, I don't mind somebody going out and catching a dozen panfish and bringing them home. Right. Uh, I mind it if they do it every day. Right. Because same body. Why don't we? You know, I, I mean, there used to be. We never kept a crappie that was under twelve inches. You know, today somebody gets a twelve inch crappie, it goes in the newspaper. Mm-hmm. And it's just because we're not giving them enough time to grow up. So I, I, there was a couple of lakes up here, especially up in the Sylvania track. If we didn't catch two dozen 22-inch crappies when we were up there, 18 to 22 inches, so that was that was a bad day. Right. So uh, so some of that stuff is it. There's you know. Ten times more people here today than there was forty years ago. Right. So, uh, so even if you say, well, they're not selling as many fishing licenses. No, but they're still selling four times as many as they did in 1970. So, and you know, and the industry around it, the the gear, the boat, the boat dealers, the every everybody is benefiting. Right, And, and it's 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 a market driven business today you know fishing is still one of the the least expensive uh recreational opportunities that you can have um because you can go to walmart and buy a 20 dollar rod today and a can of worms and go out and have fun catching fish right or you don't even need the worms you can put on a little spinner or a little jig and do the same thing um so it, it, it's an inexpensive port but it could be taken to extremes, just like anything else. Yeah. Um, you know, you you can uh, you can buy a two hundred dollar shotgun and go shoot ducks standing on the the edge of some swamp, or you can have the two thousand dollar gun and take your forty thousand dollar trip to the duck place of the world and stay in their lodge and do it that way. So you know, everything has got okay. its it, it's limits as to, to where you want to, how you want to spend your leisure time. Yeah. But it's, you know, fishing is still a leisure sport. And as long as we keep it as a, a recreational opportunity rather than looking at it as some place to get my next meal, uh, we're going to have fishing around for a long, long period of time. If we look at it as, oh, I need to go harvest all those fish, then we're not going to have it for as long a period of time. It's going to dry up. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah and, by, no and, means, by no means is this advocating for a return to the old ways of doing things. Um, although I think in like a, 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 a weird dark place, I've had a dream before about being in one of those wooden boats, getting to shoot a muskie because that just seems like a wild experience. <laughs> I, I still have my, I still have my grandfather's gun. Yeah, that's, yeah. That's shot muskies before. Oh yeah, he shot muskies with it. Yeah, it's it's one of those uh, break open guns. It's got eight shots in it. It's like a twenty five caliber, twenty seven caliber, something really weird. I don't even know if you can get bullets for it anymore. Can you imagine uh, shooting muskies in an inflatable raft? How how that would end? <laughs> oh well, it was it wasn't any better than it was in the boats. You know, they shot holes in boats all the time. And this gun, it's got about a six, uh, maybe a eight inch barrel on it. And the last two inches of the barrel is all rusted because that's the part he stuck underwater. <laughs> he always put the he always put the barrel he got underwater so you couldn't hear it. You couldn't hear the shot. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's it's like the, that, that the kind of, of being quiet when you get a fish in the net. It's put the <laughs> put the gun underwater so nobody hears you. Yeah, and that that gun is so loose the the, the it's a revolver and and. It, it's so loose that I think more lead came out of the sides than ever went through the barrel. <laughs> oh no! Oh no! That's a relic. I've never, uh, that's pretty cool, though. I have never heard of someone still even having a gun that can say this gun has shot muskies before. 
Well, we would we would we would uh, we would fish for muskies with a chipmunk. We would we, you a, took live, a, a live a live chipmunk. Yeah, <laughs> uh, you, you'd take a, a number ten coffee can, you know, the big coffee can, and you'd screw a rat trap halfway into it, and on the flapper you would put hardware cloth, you know, a real thick wire mesh, and you would. Set the trap. You put some peanut butter on the, the little trigger in there, and when a tippy ran in there, <laughs> then you would, uh, you know, the trap would close and it'd be in there. And he had this real big pair of pigskin gloves, and he'd reach in and he'd grab the chipmunk, and the chipmunk would be biting him on the hand, you know. And he'd open up the trap, and we'd have like six or seven chipmunks in a gunny sack. He'd reach in and he'd grab a chipmunk, where and he had this long cane pole. It was maybe. 20 feet long, and just, just with a piece of, I don't know, 80 pound, pound dacron tied to the tip of it, and the cane pole was probably three inches in diameter at the butt. Unreal. Oh, my God. And he had about maybe two feet of piano wire on it, and on the back of the boat, there was a little screw eye, and he would take a, a little board about maybe six or seven inches long and about two and a, two and a half, three inches wide. And he'd take a soup can and he'd cut it and put it down the middle of that for a rudder. And of course, one side was silver and the other side was gold. And that soup can was maybe an inch high. And we would pull that behind the boat. And the chipmunk, you know, oh, he had a, a brass ring. He'd stick that thing over the, the, the head of the chipmunk and take a big pebble hook and just stick it in his, in his skin about halfway up his back. And I, it was my job to row the boat. So I would row the boat, and Grandpa would sit in the back, and when when a muskie started following the chipmunk, then he'd reach down, and he'd yank that board out from underneath the chipmunk. And, you know, it took like three seconds for a fish to eat it. Unreal. And he, and he would fight the muskie until it looked like the rod was ready to break, and he'd fall in the water. And then we'd watch until the muskie swam off and stopped. And then we walked, we'd, we'd row over, he'd pick up the rod, and he'd start fighting the fish before. It was a really big fish. You might have to pick up the rod three or four times. Uh, you just let them swim around with it, and, and they'd stop after about 40, 50 feet. Usually they'd circle back. If you about the second or third time, they'd circle back to where they started. So, uh, and all they do it was time to land the fish when the rod would hit me in the head. Then I would have to put that, that pole on my shoulder and keep it up on my shoulder while I was handling the boat so that he could, he could get to the end of the line and pull the line in by hand and then pull out the gun and shoot it. What that, a that, that formative fishing experience, too. <laughs> maybe, maybe the chipmunk influenced some of your fly designs later in later years. Well, I still make a Norway rat about uh, six to eight inches long. <laughs> That's unreal. I was going to ask if the chipmunk raft influenced uh, Northwood's inflatables at all. Uh, no, no, that really never did. What, what influenced the Northwood's inflatables more than anything else was the inability for other anglers to be able to fish out of a canoe. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't tell you how many rods I had broken or lost or, or just the things that people would do that they had no experience and they couldn't they couldn't figure out how to handle themselves in a canoe I or, grew up in or it. you're six five like me with chicken legs and you don't want to be in a canoe with me that's just a good recommendation i'm, I'm, yeah, I'm well i'm over six, six and i can be in a canoe so. well you're you're a more stable fellow than me bill <laughs> so i'm a little top heavy <laughs> so um yep. I'd love to hear you talk about, you mentioned it earlier, you used to head down fish in the salt in the winter. And I think that's a pretty common thing in the musky world. You know, I, I, we see it a lot. People burn hot and bright for a little bit. They, they go at it hard. You know, maybe they were part of the heyday in the lax or whatever it may be. And then they, they kind of burn out on it. You hit them seem to burn out on muskies. You still, you're, you're there right now in northern Wisconsin still, and it seems like you still love it. What, what about them? has just kept you on the hook for so long? Their unpredictability. You know, they're, they're, no two muskies act the same. 
Now, I'll admit that most of the time, I can tell if a fish is an eater or a follower when I see it. They, they will, their body language will tell me. But not always. Sometimes they, they really fool me. Some fish that look like they're really hot aren't. And some fish look, that look like they're not hot at all and they're just a follower all of a sudden change their mind and they just explode. Um, you know, there, there's a couple of, of really great famous paintings around where there's the musky, you know, laying there in the middle of the lily pads and there's 50 bluegills around them. And one eye of the musky, you can see the painter has painted it so that that eye all of a sudden is hurting a little bit. And there's a bluegill, you know, a foot and a half away and suddenly the bluegill goes, I'm lying. Uh, and, and that's the thing that, that muskies are so unpredictable. Um, generality? Yes, we have generality. And that's what, quite honestly, I, I believe all fishing is working around those generalities that we have. Generally speaking, a, a bass does this. Generally speaking, a trout does that. Generally speaking, a muskie does this. But not always. Uh, so it's easier to dial in on those smaller fish because there's more of them. When we talk about apex predators, there's not a lot of them. I tell people all the time, musky fishing is kind of like fishing for grizzly bears. You know, it, can you make a grizzly bear eat? No, but you can't stop them from eating either. Yeah, we've talked about that as well, just behaviorally, like, you know, sometimes they're just going to saunter through town and scratch their back, and then they might attack a campground. You never know. It's just that, that, that's they, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you do you? How do you feel about like, especially where we're at now in 2024? It seems like if you would look at the musky world, it's like, oh, it's all been figured out. Everybody's figured it all out. Moon periods and and this, and apps that tell me when to fish, but it actually, in experience, at least mine, it kind of all still seems like a little bit of voodoo science. Is that, do you kind of feel that way? Like, the generalities might make sense, but the devil's in the details? Oh, yeah. It, you know, it, it, we've all read it. When's the best time to go fishing? When you can. Mm. Um, it, it, it's still the unpredictable um ways the fish feed or the, the the mood changes that they have. I mean, they can go from, you know, scared, docile creatures to absolute carnivores in the blink of an eye. And and what it is that makes them do that, we, we don't really know. We don't know what they're thinking. I tell people all the time, you know, geez, if I knew what the fish was thinking, you couldn't afford me. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the truth? Oh. I would like to like have that one day. Maybe like one day though. Just one day where you could just, you know, it's like you get to flip the switch and see behind the curtain. See what's going on. Well, I've I've been I've been lucky. I, last year I had two days we put fourteen fish in a boat. Unreal. Yeah, each day. On fly. So, so those 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 kinds of things don't happen as much anymore. You know, uh, in in the 80s and the early 90s, uh, I would see, you know, 10 to 20 fish every day. Uh, the best day I ever had, we put 23 fish in the boat. Um, I had days where we saw 60 fish in one day. So that that doesn't happen anymore. Uh, I think the the numbers of fish are there, but we've educated them to the point where they're not as gullible as they used to be. We saw the same thing with tarpon in Florida. You know, tarpon, a big tarpon fly now in Florida is about two and a half inches long because they won't take anything bigger anymore. Uh, the same, and I'm seeing the same thing here with the muskies. I've been going to smaller and smaller flies every year and doing better than I have with the great big flies. Do they sometimes still take great big flies? Yeah. When they really get revved up in, late in the fall, and it's just mostly the big fish that are still active. Those fish are really stomping down on big stuff. But most of the stuff today, six inches, eight inches, that's max for me until later in the season. And then I go to 10 inches. 
Interesting. What, um, let's talk about pressure for a little bit and, and what, you know, how you've seen that. Cause I, I think it's really easy for somebody to say that, Oh, there's so much pressure these days. You know, we're here in Madison on one of the most fish bodies of water in the state, but not many people have the perspective you do to that. So I think your, your perspective is super interesting there. What, what do you, where do you think we go from here when it comes to a problem like that? Knowing it's a generally a good thing to have more people interested in the sport because they care about these things that we care about, but it means more pressure. What's, what's I think, I think if they all stay on the lake, I'll be real happy. Hey, good. good. <laughs> well, you like me then, Bill. You like me. I, I, that's, that's been, uh, especially with the, the king lately, the river time is limited for this fella. Yeah, the, the bad part about the rivers is, uh, you know, the smaller the fish bowl, the fewer the fish. And, and if we've got, if we're going to maintain, uh, these drought conditions that we seem to be in these cycles of now, then, uh, we're going to have more difficulty in rivers, especially in the smaller rivers. You asked earlier what influenced the, the North Woods inflatable. It was really being able to get into those, those smaller deep holes in the rivers where I knew there was you know, a 20 to 40 pound fish in it. I knew there was. I, I, I interacted with them before, but you got to be quiet getting there and you couldn't be quiet in anything but an inflatable. And the reason why I went to the pontoon raft is because in all these upstream areas of these rivers, uh, there's gobs of rocks and you got to straddle the rocks. You get into a donut shaped raft. And you spend more time, you know, dragging the thing across gravel bars than you do getting to the fish. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So uh, those are some of the things I think that that made a difference with why I wanted the the pontoon raft rather than than a round raft. You know, um, that that's what really influenced that. As far as the pressure goes, you know, I think that we would. Drop a lot of the pressure if we went to, uh, just like a trout stamp, we had a musky stamp. Um, there would still be a, a, a good number of people that would buy the musky stamp and not think twice about it. They would want something in return. And if that means, you know, stocking more muskies, uh, in late, uh, you know, as you probably well know, um, Wisconsin is now considered a stock fishery. For muskies. And the thing that I've noticed in the past, oh, five to seven years is there are very few small muskies. I see muskies that are 36 inches or more, and I see very few fish that are 25 to 30 inches. And that means that we don't have very much reproduction. Mm-hmm. And our stock fish aren't good reproducers. Uh, that, that, seems to be one of the biggest problems that we have with the stock fish. They grow very quickly from 25 to 48 inches. Um, it only takes them about 10 or 15 years to get there. And, and that, that's incredible. But they don't reproduce well. I think we've bred that out of them. Um, and, and the stock that we use from the captive fish that the DNR has, is consistent, and it doesn't matter if you're a private breeder or not, you're still using those same females that you use for 20 years to produce the eggs for you. So, uh. We get to a point and, where we can't fix it because there's no more, those genetics have been. I, I believe we've already gone over that edge. Yeah. yeah. Why do you think, and I think musky fly fishing is at this unique juncture for this conversation, this, this conversation around natural reproduction, native fish. Because in fly fishing, it's almost heretical to be talking about the amount of stocking that goes into these fish, right? The stocked fish, it's, there's jokes, there's memes about it. Uh, but in muskie, it's the norm. And, and it's not really part of the conversation to talk about natural reproduction or strive for it. Why, why do you think that is? Is there a good reason to that? Or like maybe it's what you're saying. It's just we lost that battle. It's over. Well... I think I can go back to the Lee Turnin day when, when Lee was the DNR secretary. And Lee was a good guy. I like Lee. 
Um, but I think we did it wrong. And I think that it was the, the we didn't have a big enough grasp of the science at the time. You know, Lee promised us that if we spent five million dollars over the next few years, we would bring back muskies the way they used to be in, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And we all bought into that. We all wanted that. So we said, oh yeah, sure. Let's, let's do that. You know, what, what do you need? How much money do you need? The musky club got on board. Everybody got on board. And we did what I'm going to call spaghetti stocking. We threw them against the wall and see what stuck. And, I you know. There. <laughs> this is everywhere. Yeah, we put them everywhere. Where we didn't put them was in rivers. We only put them in the lakes. Because the lakes, the, the, the DNR, even in those days, was still money-oriented. So, right. you yeah. know, we, we still had to go where the dollars were, and it was easier to chase lakes than it was rivers. Well, and everybody knew. You had the resorts on the lakes. You had, the, you had all. Yeah, everybody knew the muskies were going to go into the rivers to migrate anyway. Uh, you know, so that that was just kind of a given. Um and, and we put these muskies everywhere, and through the mid-80s, we had so many muskies, it wasn't even funny. And then all of a sudden, we came out of the drought of the late 80s, we get into the early 90s, and holy crap, we don't have any muskies anymore. What happened to all our muskies? And, and, and that's when we threw more muskies on the wall again, and, uh, you know, by the by the end of the 90s and the early 2000s, we were out of muskies again. And it wasn't because people were killing muskies, because they weren't taking the majority of the muskies. It was just that the fish were not capable of reproducing the way the native fish reproduce. And so there we are today with yeah. fish that aren't capable of reproducing. And the, one of the biggest reasons why the DNR doesn't uh, deal with muskies in rivers is because they can't count them. They're too migratory. So they, they don't know if they're counting the same fish two times or four times or 20 times. So, you know, part of it's a science problem. Part of it, uh, we didn't know enough about science. Uh, now that we know a little bit more about the science than we used to know, we go, well, we're kind of screwed. You know, do we wait? What do we do? Put a moratorium on musky fishing for 10 years? That ain't going to happen. There's way too much money involved in it today. So, uh, yeah, but we're, it's hard we're stuck to, in this. It's hard to. Stocking to cycle. Yeah, because what, we're stuck in it. But what also seems to be the, the latest thing that's breaking is our stocking programs. I mean, you mentioned the idea of a musky stamp. Um, just to give the listeners like a little context and build, by all means, jump in if there's. but. We're at a phase where the last three years, our stocking procedures in Wisconsin have nearly broken, uh, especially up in the wild rose hatchery. The spooner hatchery seems to be doing a little bit better, but that's really it. That's like the state's musky fish. Musky fishery is dependent on those two hatcheries running, and they don't seem to be. And then I've been told, at least, that the reason we don't have a musky stamp is because then we would take all of the musky dollars and we put it in a stamp program. So muskies would only get what's in the stamp program. And right now they get way more because they get full license sales. But juxtapose that next to what was just released in a news article a couple of weeks ago. Hunter licenses are so far down that it's impacting fisheries budgets. You know, and it, it, all of that, it kind of is this jarbled mess of like, I don't know that I have a ton of confidence. I'd love your perspective because it's a lot wiser than mine for the next 60 years of muskies in Wisconsin. Well, I think that we're probably going to go to maybe multiple stamps. Maybe we'll have a walleye stamp, a muskie stamp, a bass stamp. You'll still be able to keep hand fish, you know, and that's going to be 10 fish a day. Like it or not, that's, that's, that's mm -hmm. where we're going with, mm -hmm. with that. Primarily because of three factors. One is pollution, and that pollution is coming from outside sources, not necessarily from, uh, you know, I mean, like up here, there's no, there's no manufacturing or anything. We're not getting pollution from uh, the, the 
factory that's sitting upstream from us. There, there is no upstream from us. <laughs> but there's overuse. There's more cabins on more lakes with more affluence of different chemical compositions that are going into the water. And, and that's disturbing the, the natural reproduction. We know we have estrogen, female hor growth hormone in our water that's coming from septic systems all around all of our lakes. So, uh, and, and that's not slowing down, you know, uh, the, the Northern Highlands region is forecast to increase population threefold in the next 10 or 15 years. So, uh, uh all of those factors, the, the use, the amount of use, oh, we're not selling as many licenses, but we're more efficient at fishing today than we were 40 years ago. Um, so uh, all of those factors play a role. I don't think we can we can single out one. Factor. No, right, right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's and especially with a fish that just had, uh, in a good, it's not a great spawning species to begin with. And as you're indicating, we've only made or contributed for many different reasons, many different factors. We've contributed to making it worse. Oh yeah, our weed growth is way down. You know, and. and Muskies are a broadcast spawner. They need about, there's about five to seven species of weed that they need their eggs to fall on to be most viable. Would they hatch out of rocks? They could. Could they hatch out of sand or substrate bottom? They could. But they need to fall on weeds and stick on the weeds to be the best that they could be. Um, or to get the most reproduction out of those, those numbers of eggs. So those, those weeds that, uh, we got the wrong kind of weeds today. We don't have the broadleaf weeds that are necessary for those musky eggs to, to fall on. Um, we've got, you know, this year we're going to have early spawning. There's no doubt about it. Right. We only have seven or eight inches of ice. Trout Lake only froze over completely about three weeks ago, maybe four weeks ago. So, you know, it, it, we've still got, different environments that we're dealing with. It's warmer, so the fish don't grow as fast in the summertime. Uh, it, it, we have these real long, protracted, dry falls where it makes it more difficult for the fish to find enough food to allow them to survive through the winter time. Um, if it's a mild winter, gee, I just saw on Facebook a couple of days ago where a guy got a 42-inch fish through the ice. That never used to happen at this time of the year. Yeah, that's usually, at least down here, that's usually right at the beginning. And then you start right. to see early again. first time and shows up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Yeah, that's, it's just, it's interesting. Um, especially like layering it into, um, you know, that's all what's happening with the environment. And then, we seemingly out of these hatcheries can barely get enough fish to just hit quotas. And it just, it makes sure. me worried. It makes me worried. And I'm wondering if I'm being too alarmist or if we're approaching something similar to what happened with turkeys or, um, you know, these we're racing to a cliff. Meanwhile, everyone, all of those people that are coming up to Boulder Junction, Hayward, the, the population growth you talk about, I would, I would reckon a lot of them expect there to be good musky fishing for them. Well, there still is. There's, there's still great musky fishing up here. And one of the things that you're forgetting about is that everything is going private. So there's, because we only have one and a half hatcheries that are state owned, publicly owned, that are creating muskies, doesn't mean that we don't have 40 other musky growers in the state. True. So True. Th those, those fish might be coming from private sources. And as long as they meet the, the DNR regulations, those musky clubs can buy those fish and they can put them anywhere they want. True. Um, That's you know, they still, when they the, still you know, follow the DNR regulation, you yep. know, recommendations. But, uh, yeah, I think that that part of it is that we're seeing more of the private sector becoming involved in that. And, and that, that's driven by the big boat manufacturers and the big tackle manufacturers because they got to sell more and more. And let's not lose sight of the fact that musky deer fishing is a cult. Musky fly fishing is a subcult. You know, there, there's probably 
less than 10% of the people that gear fish fly fish. Although I do believe that number is growing. I, I, I agree. I think the other thing I see anecdotally is that more fly anglers care about the conversation we're having right now than some of my conventional fishing buddies. Um, you know, they, they don't, they're not worried about it the same way I am. Or and I think some of that is like seeing what happened with steelhead out in the Pacific Northwest and, we, you know, fly fishing influences, um, at least for me personally. I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I think that, uh, that that's so. Although musky deer anglers are still pretty much into the catch and release thing. 100%. You know, and, and, and I have to admit that when we get fish in this region, maybe not other places in the world, but uh, when we get fish that's uh, over 50 inches, that's probably a fish that's not breeding anymore, you know. They, they breed up through about 48 inches, and after that, they probably don't breed anymore. So if you get your 50-inch fish and you want to put that 50 on the wall, well, wait for a 50. Don't 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 put the 48 on the wall because she's still making babies. Right. Um. But you know, at, at that 50-inch fish, if you want to put that fish on the wall, yeah, it's probably okay. It's not something that I would do, um, but it, that's probably okay because all that thing is doing is eating another bass or a couple of walleyes, you know. Yeah. And, I, and I'm not one of those guys who believes that the muskies are eating all the walleyes. I, I, I'm glad <laughs> to hear it. I think it was, we had, there was a study done just recently. I don't know if you got a chance to check it out by a gentleman named Camden Glade. And I think he was in Minnesota because he was aggrieved that Minnesota had kind of backtracked in their muskie program, a lot of it because of the, the voice of the walleye fishermen. So he went out on a mission to prove that muskies are not eating walleyes, and actually their diets look almost the same, walleyes and muskies. You know, yeah, of course, a couple of walleyes get into a few musky, musky bellies, but it is by no means a primary food source. So hopefully that argument dies off in the near future. Well, well muskies, muskies are always going to be opportunistic. If you got a 12 inch walleye on the line and there's a muskie lurking around somewhere, chances are he's going to go after that 12 inch walleye mm -hmm. just because it's easy to get. Yep. <laughs> well, and, and you know, same, same reason, same yeah. reason why they eat a bass. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I, I don't think that they're out there, to, you know, I mean, we know through, through, through the science, we know that suckers and, and yellow perch are the number one soft rate fish are the number one forage fish of the muskie. So, uh, you know, yellow perch, they say, uh, anything north of about Highway 29, yellow perch is the number one forage fish up there. Uh, for every fish, whether it's a bluegill or a muskie, they, they eat yellow perch at some stage of their life, and they eat quite a few of them. Um, so, yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't think that the, there's lots of walleyes that get eaten. No, but there's more walleyes being caught, and therefore it's probably that anecdotal experience of like, oh, they just keep eating them off my line. Well, it's like, well, if you're fishing for yellow perch, they'd be eating those too. Uh, is That's kind right. of a point there. Do you think fly fishing has a role to play the fly fishing musky world? It's small, but it feels small and mighty in this conversation. Specifically, what, what, where my head goes is, is there any value to things that we've seen, such as? Um, artificial only sections of river for steelhead in baldwin michigan or out west is there is there are we are we kind of is this an echo chamber of fly fishing that we need to turn off or is there some merit to this type of thing in the future in your opinion well the way i see it with with the entire fly fishing community since world war ii fly fishing has hovered somewhere between five or between uh seven and ten percent of the total tackle dollar in America. But it's the first of that, of, of all the fishing tackle. It's the first. It's the most expensive. It gets the most attention from companies that want to grow their dollars because they can, they can make more, more dollar per capita on a fly angler than they can on a conventional fisherman. Although I would argue that fly fishing is conventional. <laughs> I, I, <laughs> because it's been around for centuries more. It, it is. It is. Yeah. yeah. 
but, uh, but, but, but my point here is that, that what happens in the fly fishing world first trickles down to everybody else. Today you can buy a, a thousand dollar casting rod. You couldn't do that 20 years ago. Today you can buy a $500 casting reel. You couldn't do that 20 years ago. So, uh, um, so that technology has trickled down to the, the but they got to pay for the technology first and they pay for it with fly anglers. So once, once they have the technology paid for it, then they can distribute it downstream to more volume. So do fly anglers have a voice? You bet we do, a big voice. And, and it's because we're going to get listened to first. So if we keep beating the drum, and we keep saying, hey, gee whiz, let's go away from live bait fishing. We don't need live bait fishing. We don't need trolling. We don't need some of these other things to make it easier to catch fish. We need things that will make it challenging to catch fish. We don't go musky fishing because with flies because it's easy. We do it for the challenge. Same reason why bow hunting is becoming more popular than rifle hunting. They do it for the talent. It, it, it's sport. And as long as we're angling or hunting for sport, and there's still blood sport, no matter what you say. Totally. Uh, it, those are the people that are going to get the most uh, reverberation from what they say right. and what they practice. You know, uh, it, it's pretty common in other parts of the country for uh, for anglers to, to have a really big voice because they don't have as much water as we do. We're, we're blessed with with so much water and so much diversity. Also, it's a great right. lake. We're over very fifteen thousand miles of trout stream, yeah. gazillion lakes and, and warm water rivers. So you know we get a whole lot more voices here but the fly fishermen I, I believe are the ones that get the biggest voice from the money and the money is where where everything happens in this country today right will that change anytime soon i doubt it right yeah i don't i i, I doubt it as well um yeah it's interesting though to think about especially back to what we talked about earlier which is like where it's really gotten to today, if we're going to play out the hunting metaphor, is you know fly fishing might be akin to bow hunting, but we also have guys out there fishing with effectively turrets and drones. <laughs> I mean, from the oh, yeah. you know you got you got three guys in the boat, each of them get what three baits, so you now you got a, a nine bait spread. You got live scope off two sides; they can't hide. And I, I know, you know, we'll all kind of play into the cliche of saying, you know, woe is me, get rid of all this technology. But I think there is, to your point, if the the fish aren't getting more plentiful, um, and this is really a sport, a recreation sport, you know, we, we should kind of shift those principles. Because, like, even hearing you talk about, man, we had a 24 fish day, you know, we, we know, I, I, I mean, I'm picturing what that looked like in a raft with fly rods, flies that you made. And I compare that to someone who had a 24 fish day today with four live scopes and nine baits and it, it doesn't, it doesn't get me as excited. And I think the consumer is going to feel that too, hopefully. I'm encouraged by some of the, the backmasters of mm. type tournaments that are now limiting the electronic. Um, and, and, and that's a good thing. I, I think that we, we maybe have gone too far over the tech edge. You know, the live scope probably really brought that out. It, it, it's just, it's not, it's not, it's not even a sport anymore. You know, it, it, it's just, okay, there's a fish over there on the other side of the lake that looks like we ought to be able to catch that when it's big enough. Let's go try that. Nope. You know, close, I mean, not on its nose yet, Bill. Can you? I, I can just get it a little closer to its nose there. You know, poke it. Uh, like it, you hear these guys talk about how they're fishing and they're using language we would never use in the boat. They're like, "I can see it. It moved. See if you can snag it in the face." And it's just it. It gets me. Gets me a little angry. But uh, let's. Oh yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead. It, well, there's no doubt about it that that I, I believe that we've 
protect ourselves to the point where we we got to be careful about going beyond. Right. If if of, of you know, I think from your perspective too, which there is some weight. It's not just anecdotes. If we've already before live scope influenced and pressurized these fish, what does it mean after that? But um, let's talk about something more fun. Uh, you you well, okay? Go ahead. I, I, I've had I've had the best whiskey day I'll ever have in my life already. I had five fish. I landed five fish over fifty one day. That will never happen. Tell us about that me. day. Can you tell us about that day? I was in November. I was on the Wisconsin River, and there was oh, nobody yeah. else. Oh, it was maybe twenty years ago. Okay. Uh, I was on the Merrill stretch, so yep. you know it's, that's a real popular stretch. But okay. back then, you know, there was only one or two other guys that were fishing it. And I wouldn't even fish it until things froze out up here. So it was like the middle of November. It was a full moon week. Uh, it was actually a full moon day. And I went fishing with a buddy of mine down there, put the boat in it, Merrill took out down at uh, the halfway point. And every fish that day decided that it was going to wait for me. But my buddy was in the front. Now, my buddy couldn't cast. He, he was, he was, a, you know, when I say couldn't cast, he could make a 25 or 35 foot cast, but he couldn't be accurate. Me, on the other hand, I can be real accurate at 60 feet, 70 feet. So, um, I'd give him the first shot and he'd say, okay, go for it. You know, I'd lay the fly and every, every one of those fish was in a log jam. They were sitting there. I had the right fly. It was a dark colored sucker type pattern. It was, uh, Single hook, no articulations, nothing else. It was about 10 inches long. And every one of those fish hammered that fly. Mm. And I never missed the one, you know. I, and he caught one 39-inch fish, and I had five over 50. And it was, I'm glad I had a good, I'm glad I had a good net, man. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's probably, the, as far as the story goes, that's probably the best day musky fly fishing anyone's ever had, Bill. I'd reckon it's up there in the top <laughs> couple, five over fifty. I mean, it, it, that, it, it'll never happen again. Yeah. You know, it was it was just it was one of those days. It all happened within about an hour and a half as the moon was rising. I mean, what, what I found with the moon in the fall is if the moon's on the moon, uh, up, the fish are going to eat. Once it gets to its apex, they're done. Might as well go home. I don't care what time of the day it is, they're done. Interesting. Interesting. So, Did you know? Go ahead, Josh. Go ahead. Oh, so Bill, inversely to that story, is there a fish over the course of your career that you've lost that still haunts your dreams, like a, a big Leviathan creature that you think about every so uh, often? There's, there's one. I, I was in college. I just got home from college. My first, the first thing that I thought about was getting in the boat and going out and, and musky fishing. And that was the first thing I did the first day that I was home. Jumped in Dad's boat, took off across the lake. And for, I don't know why it just happened the way it did. But I, I'm moving real nice and slow, you know, just putting along in the boat. And there's a mallard swimming between two of the islands. If you're familiar with Fish Trap Lake, I grew up on Fish Trap, or at least in my college years. I, my parents owned property on fish trap. And between the, the two islands where the, the shallowest channel is, uh, there was a full-grown mallard. And for some reason, I thought, you know what? If I was a big muskie, and I knew that there was a big muskie in that hole that I was near, I, I thought, you know, if I was a big muskie, I'd be following that big old mallard. And I ripped off a bunch of line, and this would have been 1978. And uh I threw about a 70-foot cast out. The mallard got up and took off. I made about three strips, and I got hammered. And I just put the rod in my gut and stuck it as hard as I could. And, and then this is on an eight-weight rod. That fish, came out, yeah, that fish came out of the water. It, it, it was more than 50 inches. came completely out of the water on the set took off and started running between the islands and I just stared down on it and I turned them and I got them coming back towards the deep hole. I thought, I got this. 
Thumbs up again. He rolled on the surface. And my line went limp. <clears throat> cut the leader. Cut the steel. Uh, or m- maybe he didn't cut it. Maybe the steel just had a weak point in it. They it got wrapped around or whatever. It's gone. Ten seconds later, the fish jumped again. Another ten seconds, it jumped again. It was trying to throw the hook. So with, whether I hooked it on in the gills or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah. All the way. <laughs> Oh, my God. Dang. And, and I never, I, I didn't see that fish again for about 15 years. And I, I had a, a customer. We were fishing in that same bay. And uh, I told him, I said, there's a big fish in here. I know she's here. Uh, but I haven't seen her in a long time. He throws in, hooks a, hooks a pike about 36 inches. That fish came up and T-boned that pike. It was huge. Holy cow. And, and uh, um, took off and, and let go of the pike. And the, that, the bite mark on that pike was about eight inches wide. Unreal. Um, but uh, that fish, that, that's one fish I never caught. Uh, oh. That's one I can say that I hooked that I never caught. I've seen some big fish, but never hooked them. Right, right. Um, but, but that's one that I hooked and never caught. There's something about the the... And maybe it's just me and a, being a Wisco boy through and through, but there's something about like those shallow lake northern Wisconsin giants that like that's the picture of the muskie in my head. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, I know that if, if I wanted to catch bigger fish, I should probably move to Canada or live on Green Bay or have gone to Mille Lacs in 2006. But there's nothing better than, you know, it just seems like the center of the universe is it's kind of right where you're sitting right now, Bill. Yeah, I kind of like that. Yeah, that's good. Um, talk to me about that. So you've you've talked about this on, I think, another podcast. I've seen you comment about it on some Facebook threads, but you're in a pretty special geographic region to Wisconsin that is very different from the rest of the state. Why Why is it so important to you? Why should it be so important to all of us muskie anglers? Fishing, really, just anglers in general. Well, you know, Wisconsin is geologically probably the most unique state in the U.S. There's no other place in the world like what we have here. And it was only because of an anomaly of nature that, that Wisconsin was created. And, and that includes the driftless. Why the driftless got skipped, nobody knows. Still can't figure it out. Um, but here we are, this region that I'm in is called the Northern Highlands. 15,000 years ago, a mile thick ice sheet was melting. In the 20,000 years prior to that, there were three glaciers that came down from Canada. One came straight down, one came from the northeast, and one came from the northwest. They chopped down all these mountains that are between here and Lake Superior. Now, those mountains are the southern extension of the Laurentian chain. The Laurentians go up and make one side of Hudson Bay. At one point in Earth's history, they were taller than the Himalayas are today. So we're talking about some huge mountains. As the glaciers moved through here, they chopped down all those mountains. The, The tops of those mountains carved out all these shallow lakes in what used to be the foothill to those mountains. And after that melted, it left all these lakes with all that water that was impacted underneath of them for tens of thousands of years. And now, after the glaciers receded, that water is upwelling. It's coming up. Guess what? We're running out of that water. I was told by a geology teacher in college that northern Wisconsin would run out of water in my lifetime. Didn't believe them. I do now. Our spring ponds don't have as much flow as they used to. Look at Lang Lake County. It doesn't have as much spring flow as it used to. That impacted water that was pushed down into the earth for so many centuries is starting to run out. Will it be gone in my lifetime? Of course not. But it's going to be different. And it is, it's already different. I know trout streams in the 
central and western part of the state that don't exist anymore that I caught trout in when I was in college. So uh, it, it's it's different today than it was, but it's still the most unique part of Wisconsin because here we are with all these tens of thousands of lakes sandwiched between miles and miles and miles of river. And I sit at the top of the hill of this plateau. I'm, I'm sitting at the top right here where I'm sitting. I'm a thousand feet above Lake Superior. Not very many people can say that in Wisconsin. Everything is downhill from me in every direction. The better trout streams are to the, to the east. The better warm water rivers are to the west. And right in the middle between all of that is all these lakes. Two main rivers, the Wisconsin and the Manitowich, which becomes the Flambeau. Both of them flow into the Mississippi. But here I sit at the very edge of the Mississippi River watershed. And I'm also sitting at the very edge of the Lake Superior watershed. I'm also sitting at the very edge of the Lake Michigan watershed. That's incredible. I find it equally as credible. How do we get more people, especially younger people, when we when we paint the picture of what that place could look like in the next 80 years? How do we get more people to, to think that same way? Population explosion is inevitable. It's happened in this planet since humans started walking on two legs. Um, we're not going to stop population explosion, but we probably can limit it. Now, the one limiting factor that we have here is that somewhere around 85% of Vilas County, the county that I live in, is public land. DNR isn't selling land. To the average Joe, I, I have I have some very wealthy clients. They're like, "What's the possibility of the DNR selling me 20 acres in the middle of the woods somewhere?" This is zero. <laughs> it belongs to us, and we're going to keep it. So, uh, one of the one of the reasons why this area is not populated is because the severity of the winters. The other reason is because it's too far from population centers. But as those population centers like Wausau and Rhinelander continue to grow, we're going to get more people that are going to move into a more congested area up here. Um, and, and we're going to get more pressure on the resources because of that. You have to remember that at one point in, in this country's history, not that long ago, there was wilderness in Massachusetts. Uh, so Ohio was considered way out on the western frontier. And Ohio became a state in 1803. So so there's there's lots and lots of, of pressure. Then more people are going to gravitate to where it feels wilder. And it's, it's probably always going to feel a little wilder here than it does in Madison. That's just natural. Depends. So, what, depends what is your definition of wild? I mean, a State Street can can. I, I don't think well, that's what we're talking about. But yes, I agree. I agree. Natural wild. <laughs> so so yeah, I I think that some of that stuff. You know, I mean, I'm no um, economics major or anything, and I can't tell you exactly what the demographics are going to be. But uh, but we're going to get more people here, whether we like it or not. Right. Um, uh, you know, and, and you're going to get more people in Madison, whether you like it or not. Yep. So, yeah, so, I think it's, it's, I am generally a pretty optimistic person. I think it's, the facts on the ground don't support, you know, it's kind of like this natural wild arbitrage. More people want it. It's less easy to find. Well, more, well, more swimming, more swimming fly. Yeah. We want more of that is exactly right. Um, I just, I just wonder if you know maybe humans will rise to the occasion and and uh, keep these places as good as possible. I just want a shot at a five fish fifty inch day once in my life, mm. but I, I I don't know. We it's might gonna have... be a tough one for you to define, Daniel. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right, Josh. 
here in the in the lower uh, lower reaches of their their ring. Uh, I need to time out here, guys. Just yep, for a couple go, minutes. Yeah, go for it. All good. Yeah. I okay, that. I'm back. I just had to beat somebody out of the door. Oh, <laughs> no problem. Well, we're yeah, we're, we'll uh, wrap it up here pretty soon. Here, Bill. Yeah, we got a, a couple more good ones. This has been awesome. Um, we did that. We did that. Let me just get back and show them here. Oh, I know. So, yeah, I'm glad you prompted me to let's get off the uh, future of the world talk and talk about muskies again. So I think you do a lot of things uniquely and by nature of, you know, you, you've developed your own way listening to nature, as you talked about. And one of those that I've heard you talk about that I'm very fascinated with, uh, polling, sight fishing for muskies. Now, without... You know, we're not we're not looking for you to have to share all your dirty little secrets there, but just that just sounds like the coolest pinnac like the pinnacle of musky fishing is polling sight fishing fly rod. Yes. Didn't even really know it existed until I heard you start talking about it. Tell me some more. Well, well it doesn't exist much up here anymore because now the season opens later into the year and we don't really have that uh, as many opportunities. To, to go out and, you know, chase those fish through the shallows. Wasn't it a really great thing at the time? It was cool. But, you know, in retrospect, it probably messed up with some of the fishing spawning activities. So the, the fish spawning activities. So maybe that wasn't the, the best thing in the world to do. Um, but, but it was a lot of fun doing it. I'll say yeah. that. Um, Maybe that's and, and, supposed to be then. You know, there was, or, you know, I mean, it's just like, you know, everybody used a boga grip for about three or four years until we figured that out. And, and it was the same thing with the, the, the sight fishing for the muskies. And, and when the season changed up here and we gave the fish more opportunity to, uh, to spawn, it was probably a, a, you know, kept the fish in the game for a longer period of time. I do think that the DNR has a pretty good handle on the lake. The, the rivers are suffering, but I think that they've got a pretty good handle on the lake. And again, it's, it's still augmented with stocking, and those stocks that are still at least attempting to, to reproduce. Yep. Um, one of the things I wanted to mention was that but one, one aspect of fly fishing uh, that I see becoming more common is people gravitating away from gear. And the first they were musky fishermen and they started uh, throwing flies for muskies. And that was awesome. And, and they really got, they really loved that. So before long, they started doing everything with a fly rod. And, and there's a number of people that have gravitated from gear all the way into fly tackle completely. And they're, they're totally immersed in in fly fishing now and, and that's helped the sport quite a bit it has brought some younger people in it's brought some um uh, diverse um uh, notions of of what you can do and can't do uh i, I i'm always gratified when i see those early in the season uh etiquette articles that come out and say hey you know we're, we all have a place to share, and maybe you shouldn't be walking on top of that guy right next to you. And, and you know, somewhere in our fishing careers, we probably all did that just because we weren't aware of, of what it was, what was expected. Uh, so those articles have a place. Um, uh, and, and there's, you know, if you're going to be fishing the Jersey Shore, they probably don't have anything. They don't even have a spell etiquette. But, <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, a lot of that stuff, I, I think, is uh, is doing the sport good. Uh, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with with uh, spreading the price around a little bit. My, my customers always say to me, how come we never see anybody else where we go fishing? Well, that's by design. Yeah, <laughs> we can go to those places if you'd like. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, that's good. Bill, what's next for you? Another guide. Well, another guide. That's coming soon, I think. 
sooner than I would like. Uh, uh, but I do have some, I got some fixed up my sleeve, yeah. Good. Um, um, so I'm 68. Birthday's coming up in another few weeks. It, it's not as easy as it used to be. There's no doubt about that. It gets harder to pull the oars by the end of the season every year. I've cut myself back to, to guiding just the three days a week now. Just, um, just three days a week. Yeah. Yeah. That's I, I used to do, I used to do six. Yeah, that's crazy. I, I said it like that because I know some folks who are young and spry and 25 and three days a week is a lot of work. Yeah. And to hear you say that. <laughs> they need- well, you know, I think that the, the too many people are using trolling motors too. Yeah. I, I, I've got a little outboard, a little two and a half horse outboard that there's only two places that I use it. And both of those are because the, the, the takeout on the reservoir is about three and a half miles from uh, the, where the river dumps into it. So I motor that. Other than that, it, it's always going to be Armstrong for me. I think thinking, that there's... I'm thinking of the same takeout. I, I almost got lost back there once when the water was super high <laughs> because I couldn't find, I couldn't find my path to the, I was motoring a, a drift boat down it and I couldn't find my path through all the marsh and the water was high. So all my stumps and all of my river channels were gone and we just, <laughs> We almost ne- didn't make it to the boat landing, but yeah, yeah, that's good. What would you recommend but, to somebody starting out in fishing? Whether it's, man, I want to open a fly shop, I want to be a guide, or I want to follow my passion. Where, where well, you know, they, they say the best way to become a millionaire in a fly business is to start out with $3 million. Uh it, it, It's not easy today. If you have the drive to do it, then you can do it. I didn't have anything. I had 10 grand when I started, you know, uh, 35 years ago, I had nothing. But, uh, but I recognized that it takes dedication and it takes work. And if you're going to treat your fishing business like it's a vacation, you're not going to survive. I've been in this community for 35 years with my own business. I've seen lots and lots of businesses come and go. For three or four years, they were great. And then the owner said, well, I need to take more me time. And they started using more uh, of their time to turn it into leisure time. And as soon as they did that, their business started dropping off. Their customers started going away. And the next thing you know, they're out of business. Hmm. So if you're going to work, work. But if you're going to play, then set time out to play, but set that time out when you're not going to be making your best dollars. The reason why I don't guide on Saturday is so that I can be available to anybody who has a nine-to-five, five-days-a-week job or whatever. They can always find me in the shop on Saturday. I'm always here. So uh, that's important. Is, is trying to, to do that. The other thing that I didn't totally buy into was being uh, on everybody's uh, pro staff. Uh, you know, I I don't I don't want to have to say to you, oh yeah, go buy X Y Z rod because I, I'm on their pro staff. That 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 never appealed to me. I wanted to get the best equipment that I could from anybody I wanted to get it from and and not just from a source, not saying, oh, they're the best and they're the best because they give me the the stuff that I I don't want to be influenced by that stuff. You know, so that, that, yeah, yeah. yeah. it's okay to be on a few pro staff. I am on a few pro staff. I'm probably on more than I really realize because I don't take advantage of them. (laughs) They're just putting you but, without letting you know. Oh yeah, yeah. I I had a I had a uh, one of my reps call me up this winter and he says, well, he says you're on such and such as uh, wholesale list. I said, really? I've never bought anything from him. <laughs> Cut but I guess I'm a dealer. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right. Oh yeah. Well, that's awesome, um, man. This was this was I'm honored. So, so this is awesome. One one thing I want to mention. Please, yeah. Uh, 
I, I'm working with a learning company right now. For the last year and a half or so, just about everything I do on the vice gets videotaped. We are building, uh, they are building an app for me. It will be released in a few months. It'll be ready for publication. I just got a look at the first uh, iteration of it, and it's incredible. Um, we're going to have a fly tying and fly fishing app that is unlike anything you've ever seen before that's available today. Um, so that's uh, that, that's going to be maybe my 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 feather in my cap at the end of my my career is going to be producing this app that, uh, and I don't know anything about about the technical indications of it at all. But uh, I, right now I've got three video cameras sitting here looking at me. And, uh, you know, the, the amount of information and the way that we're going to present it is unlike anything you've ever seen. So that, that's going to be pretty cool, and that's coming up probably by May, I'm hoping. That sounds incredible. Holy cow. And where, uh, where can we point to folks towards? Uh, where will it be available? We'll have a big rollout when it's ready. Good. We might have to do a follow-up episode about that app yeah, that this awesome. summer. At some so many reasons. I think it's uh, exciting to hear you. Like, as, you know, I always go back to, like, why am I here? I'm just this little kid obsessed with fishing. And, like, that version of me is so excited to hear all of that preserved for ages and ages to come. So that's awesome. Stay tuned, everybody. Big things happening up at We Tie It. <laughs> cool. Anything else, gentlemen? This was, a, like I said, a lot of fun. Very honored. Uh, glad we got to meet. Hopefully, uh, we'll make it up there and see you on one of those Saturdays and, and maybe uh, maybe row you around. Although, you might sounds like you might like to row us around, but I think uh, uh, we'd, uh, we'd, we'd be honored to get in the boat with you one of these days and make it happen. But this was super special. Uh, Bill Shear. If you are in Boulder Junction, if you haven't been, you need to go. Muskie Capital of the World, the real Muskie Capital of the World, I believe. Uh, That's right. It's our registered trademark. Yes, the real Muskie Capital of the World. Uh, we tie it fly shop. Go check it out, folks. Until next time, we got the Spot Burn Podcast. We got Josh, Dan. Thank you to our sponsors, Cortland Line Company, Stealthcraft Boats, and a huge thank you to Bill Shear for joining us on this episode. Thanks, guys. It was great fun. Awesome. Until next time. Thank you for listening to the Spot Burn Podcast. Coming to you from the dungeon, this podcast is presented by Musky Fool Fly Fishing Co. We want to thank our awesome sponsors, Cortland Line Company and Stealth Craft Boats. We also want to thank all of you, our listeners, for tuning in subscribing, sharing, and spreading the good word. If you haven't heard, go check us out at muskyfool.com. Have fun out there on the water, y'all.